Why do I make this recommendation to create an LLC? It is because an LLC provides two forms of protection. Now this initial protection doesn't really apply right now to currency, but I'm going to explain it to you anyway so you get a good understanding of how LLCs work. LLCs will provide inside protection as well as outside protection. So, yes. LLE are limited liability entities. They cover limited partnerships and limited liability companies. All right, so limited liability companies look like this. They're boxes. Okay. Now, this is a limited liability company right here. These are assets, these pieces of candy. So I have the orange and the yellow, those represent dinar, $25,000 notes going in there, a whole bunch of them. And I've got some blue ones, which are rental property that I have, I'll put that in there. And then I've got a bunch of other stuff, cash and savings, maybe put a vehicle in there. And I don't know what else you might have, some gold, I throw it all in there. Now, does this protect me? Absolutely. Because with LLCs, when they're created, these boxes, you've just boxed up all of your assets. So you own the box. You, do no, you no longer own the assets themselves. You own the box. So as the owner of the box, you're insulated from whatever happens inside of the box. So if you have assets inside of here and something happens and a lawsuit develops inside of the box, anything happen to me? Has anything happened to me? No. No, nothing's happened to me because I own the box. The box can have all the liability at once, but nothing happens to Clint. You see the asset protection there? You see how I'm unprotected? Because the liability stays trapped in this box and I can just throw the box away afterwards. And all that problem that happened inside of here will stay with the box. But is that asset protection? Doesn't sound like it, does it? Because what did I put in here initially? Everything. Yeah, but what, what were those things? Nars, yeah, but what, it was, weren't they hard pieces of candy? I put in hard pieces of candy into one box, a whole bunch of them. And look what's happened because of one lawsuit. Do not come up and talk to me and say that you slipped on a piece of candy. Okay, I've now warned you. There's candy on the ground up here. Uh, I'm sorry, I took your candy. All right, the point is, is that the candy, you put all the assets into one box, we put dissimilar assets into here, one lawsuit, turned it all into sugar. Everything was at risk inside of this one box. So when we talk about asset protection, we're going to break your assets up based upon asset classifications. That is, if they're safe assets, put all the safe assets into one box. So can I borrow this one right here? <laughs> what, what's your favorite flavor, orange or blue? OK, Gail, we'll leave some oranges here. Do you like purple? No. OK, so if all of this stuff is safe, this is all dinar, in cash, in gold, goes into there. You know why? That's never going to create liability for you. It's never, you're not going to be sued from holding that type of asset because it doesn't do anything. People aren't getting hurt. What, are you going to have somebody over and say, look at the nar. Here, you want to hold one? As soon as they grab it, you pull it back real quick and give them this sharp paper cut across their hand. And then they, they start screaming because they're uh, uh, hemophiliac, and they start bleeding out right there, and you can't staunch the bleeding. Does that sound absurd to you? I think so. And so that's, I mean, I just thought of that off the cuff. That'd be the, the only thing, only liability you might ever have from owning dinar inside of a box where somebody could sue you. But other than that, nobody's going to get hurt. So put all of it all of your safe assets into this one box and you will be protected. And this is from outside protection because when I put safe assets in here, I'm not concerned about something happening in there. What I'm concerned about is something happening on the outside of the box. That is Clint being sued. Now my real estate that you own, 
And this, you know, I know only a few people said they have rental real estate right now. But if you have re real estate, it wouldn't go in this box. You would create additional boxes. So you would have something that looks like this. You would have a box here. This would hold your cash, dinar. And then you would create a separate box for real estate. Now, would I put all of my real estate into one box? No. I would break these boxes up for the dangerous assets based upon your overall equity value. So I look at the property and say, how much equity do I have on this property? If I had Two, uh, three pieces of property, and two of them had equity. The total equity here was 350000 I might put that in both of them into one. And then I would say for my third property, if it had $250,000 in equity, I would stick that into a third limited liability company. So now, if anything happened with this LLC right here, LLC number two, this is number three, this is number one, you're down here and your wife's right here, okay, as well, and you guys own all of these LLCs. If anything happened with number two, then the only thing you stand to lose is what's in number two. What's behind door number one and door number three remains protected because it's a separate legal entity. You boxed up your assets, you have different boxes here. Whatever happens inside of the box stays inside of the box. And that's why we use limited liability companies for our investments from an asset protection standpoint. We want to break the assets up into different asset classifications. Now, the other benefit these entities provide is from outside protection. That is, Clint going down the apartment manager and buying beer, okay, or you're involved in a lawsuit because you built property on somebody's or built something on somebody else's property, or you're involved in an accident. And believe me, strange things happen. Now, understand that this example I'm about to provide you comes from California, the land of fruit and nuts. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's strange, and you have, you have an attorney that represents them. There are more attorneys in California than any other industrialized country in the world. Okay, that's the problem we have down there. I mean, that's the one state that I know of where somebody sued, brought so many frivolous claims, now he's barred from ever bringing another case in the state of California unless he gets leave of a court. Because he teamed up with an attorney. They go around and sue businesses, saying they violated the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. And finally, they caught this joker because he said he was at this two different businesses all the way across town at the same time on the same day. And he said, wait a minute, how could you be 50 miles here at the same time? When you said you're here in L.A., but you also said you're over here in a different county on that day at that time. So they found out they were running a scam. Well, our client was driving one night, and he had the green light. He was going through an intersection at a you know, safe rate of speed, and somebody came along and T-boned him, a drunk driver. Now, the good news is my client was not severely injured. He was injured. I mean, it hurts to be hit. Okay, I could write together a 10-page demand letter that would get you about $12 million, but, you know, <laughs> we'll figure that one out later. So he settled with the insurance company that represented the drunk driver. The drunk driver, of course, was cited by the officer who arrived on the scene. The policeman said, you're driving drunk. You're cited for that. It was obvious. This guy had the green. You had the red. You ran a red light. Simple enough, right? What does drunk driver do? He goes on whocanisue.com. He finds an attorney to represent him, and now our client is being sued for over a million dollars by the drunk driver who hit him for injuries that the drunk driver sustained in the accident. Yeah, I know. How screwed up is that? So what do you do in situations like that? Shoot the attorney, right? <laughs> That's what people think. It's a good start, right? Okay, but the problem is, is that there's, the, 
there's nothing out there to prevent that lawsuit from going forwards other than are you willing to settle? It's a big shakedown for our client right now in this particular action. And it's unfortunate. But that's why when we look at these LLCs, I'm telling you that you can protect yourself so you don't have to worry about shakedowns because they can shake that tree all they want and nothing's coming out of it because my trees are made of boxes. I'm not holding stuff in my own name. So you sue me and I look at you and I say, hey, bring you on, bring, give it your best shot. I don't need a high-powered attorney to defend me because if you're successful, you don't collect because I have these boxes set up and they provide me asset protection. And the way it works is as follows. When you put your dinar into a limited liability company, and the way we do that right now before it's been converted to cash is we ledger it in. So we create an LLC for you. And then there's a Schedule A that is attached to your LLC, which lists all the assets that are owned by your limited liability company. And so on that Schedule A, we list the amount of dinar that you own. And we say, on this day, I transferred the following dinar into this LLC. Now, sometimes people look at me and say, well, Clint, I still hold on to it. I know you're the custodian of it, as am I with my dinar. My dinar have been ledgered over into my LLC, but they're in my safe. It's just the way it is. So my LLC now owns these dinar. So at that point in time, if something were to happen, could they take your dinar from you? If they asked you, if they deposed you, Elena, if I depose you and I ask you, do you own any dinar? What do you say? No. That's right, you do not. Do you own anything? Okay, so you say, I own a box. That's not what I wanted to hear, is what the attorney's going to say. Because the box is discouraging to the attorney. Because they know that that box is not something that they can take from you. So when you have it inside of this box, I cannot come up and say, give me your box. And the way your ownership is designated in a box is that you're listed as a member. Members. That means it denotes ownership. You get little certificates that say you're a member in this box. So they can't take these from you. Why? Who says they can't take them from you? Any idea? The law. The legislature. The state legislature states that they cannot take them from you. What they say, not all, this is not uniform by the way, not all legislatures and states have adopted what I'm about to tell you. The states that we like to work with, their law does not give a creditor the right to take your box from you. They do give them a remedy, but it's not a remedy that is palatable from my point of view. Because they say you cannot have this individual's box. You can't tell the individual to sell his box and pay you what he received from it. You can't tell the individual that owns it to reach into his box and pull out the candy and give you the candy. All you can do is tell that individual that if you ever take the candy out of the box, it's going to go to the plaintiff. And that's called a charging order. So if money is ever distributed out of this box to you, and you have a judgment against you, then that money shall go directly to your plaintiff and not to you until that judgment is paid off. Okay? So, let's think about this. I create a box. I'm listed as the member. Now, your box needs somebody to run it. We call them managers. So, when we've created things, I could probably use more boxes. When we create our box and we need to appoint a manager for that box, hey Greg, can I get a cup of coffee? Yeah, thanks. So I need to create a manager for my box. Who am I going to appoint as the manager of my box? <laughs> nice one. I haven't started drinking yet. Okay, given the fact I'm blonde, you get a few drinks of me, I may make you the manager. Uh, what were you going to say? Well, you, 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 Doug. Doug Denarlis. 
All right, he wants to be the man. Well, it's your box, Doug. Who are you going to make the manager? You're right, yourself. See, the manager of the box decides if there are going to be any distributions from the box. You with me? Okay. So if any distributions will be made, they're from the manager of the box. So you have a box set up, somebody sues you, and they slap a charging order on your box. And it says that they're entitled to receive any distributions. So one day you go to yourself and you say, Clint. Can I have a distribution? Oh, I guess I can. Well, no, Clint. You can't have a distribution because you have a charging order on your box. Okay, don't give me a distribution then. That's how it would play out. Okay, as long as you can have that conversation with yourself, you don't have a split personality that may work against you, <laughs> this will work for you. Now, What qualifies as a distribution? No, a distribution with a box, you get a checking account. And you pull something out of it, you write yourself out a check, and you don't classify it as anything, that's a distribution. So, there's something now that's floating around that we haven't touched on, and I know there's a question. Well, Ray, I, we're going there. Ray said build a new box and move the assets in the other box. Not quite there yet. Is anybody wondering about something, you know? You, you cannot take assets out of the box because it would go to your creditor. Does that worry anybody? Mark? Yes, yes. You look at it and you go, oh, I'm hungry. I want orange candy, Tammy says, but I can't get to it. So we don't take distributions. Okay? What we do instead is we say, Clint, well, you're not going to give me a distribution. Well, give me a loan. <laughs> what terms are you going to offer me? How about 10 years, 5% of balloon payment? You going to pay it back? Absolutely, you can trust me, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> right? You can do that. It's called a loan. Loans will work. You can take loans. Now, Nick, to put together a loan, is it just you write on the check loan and just take checks every month? Oh, another loan today. How cool is that? <laughs> no, you don't. Okay, you have to actually put together a promissory note. You have to have commercially reasonable rates of terms built into that, and you have to have the intent to repay it. And then it can be respected as a loan. So you're just not going about your daily life. You have to do some things. But if it's a loan, then it's not considered a distribution, and they cannot go and attach it. Another way to take money out of this box that is not considered a distribution would be to take a management fee. Wow. Well, I mean, if you hire, ask Clint to manage your box for you, I'm not going to do it for free. Why should you manage that box for free? If you're the manager, you shouldn't. So pay yourself a management fee. That's not a distribution. Now, this is getting a little complicated here. We might cover this coverage tomorrow. But if that were to happen, if you were ever involved in a lawsuit of that nature and they had a charging order against you, I would create a corporation for you and nestle it right upside your box. Looks nice and pretty as the manager. You'd be working for this little box, and then your little box would charge the big box pieces of candy to manage it. And that would go up to here, and then it would go out to you as a payment and salary. So that's how you could get money out of this box through a management fee. Yeah? Her question is, when I take money out of the box, is that when the taxable event occurs? Correct. Okay, no. Taxes happen irrespective of what you pull out of here. If the box makes money, you own the box, you pay tax on whatever's generated inside of here. If it makes no money, you don't pay any tax on it. Distributions that you're taking out are not taxable. We don't pay attention to the distributions. All we pay attention to is 
how much money was made inside of the box this year. And then you pay tax on it come April 15th. Question I get all the time with the NAR conversion. When do I pay tax on it? When you pay, file your tax return, come April 15th. Well, how about if it's in the LLC and I'm pulling money out? Is that taxable to me? No. You know this. Let me put it to you a different way. You have a savings account. Your savings account generates for you $100 in interest. When you pay taxes on that money, every time the bank sends you a statement and hey, you made $5 this month in interest, do you then have to send Uncle Sam a, his 25, 35%? No. You pay tax at April 15th when you file your 1040. Now, if you go down to your savings account, you made $100 in savings, okay, you with me on that? We made $100 in savings this year in interest. If you went to your savings account in November and took out $5,000, do you have to report $5,000 in income on your tax return because you pulled $5,000 out of your savings account? Why not? But you took it out. You already paid taxes on it. It doesn't matter if you took it out or not. It's your money. You already paid taxes on it. The only thing we're concerned about is did the money inside of the box make any money? So when you're pulling money out of the box, that is not the taxable event. The taxable event occurs at the end of the year when we look at the box as a whole and say, did this box make any taxable income for the year? And if it did, and you own 100% of it, you're liable for 100% of the tax. If Jane and you are partners in the box, and she owns 60%, and you own 40%, well, then she'll pay 60%. 60%, I mean, that that income would be allocated to her, 40% to you, regardless if you ever took any money out. It just happens. Sorry? No, no, I said I'm sorry. <laughs> Most of your troubles were washed away not too long ago. And they all went to Texas, I heard. Yeah, we lost, we lost yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. How does it work? Well, I think we can restate our question as follows. She wants to know, where do you set up your LLC to gain the best asset protection? If you live in Louisiana, do you have to create a Louisiana LLC to protect yourself, or are you free to choose where you create your entity? The fact is, you're free to choose where you create your entity. And that's the great part about being in this country. I do not have to set up my LLC in Louisiana and avail myself of their laws if I don't want to. I can choose another jurisdiction. Now, with that being said, you also have to understand that there are certain situations where you do not have an option. When you own rental real estate or you're running an active business, you have to be filed in the state, thank you, where you're conducting that business. There's no choice there. But when you have an LLC whose sole responsibility is to hold investment assets, there's no business we're running through here, then you're free to choose any state to set up that company in. And when given the choice, I'm going to pick a jurisdiction that puts up a nice impediment to creditors. Now let's talk about your state here. Your laws are fairly good when it comes to asset protection for LLCs. They have what I like to see in them, that the charging order is the sole and exclusive remedy. Does it say sole and exclusive, Greg? Mark, right? Sole and exclusive. Those are key words, sole and exclusive remedy. What it means is that everything I just talked about is the only thing your creditor can get. They can't foreclose on your interest and take it from you. That's what happened in Florida last summer. Uh, if, you ever, if you're interested in that, you can research, type in Clint Coons and Olmstead, O-L-M-S-T-E-A-D. I've written a few articles on it in a video, video I put together on this decision. Basically what happens, FTC went down to Florida, a guy had some LLC set up. He argued that the FTC could not take his LLCs from him because charging order protections apply. The Florida Supreme Court made an intellectual leap 
and said, oh yes, we can. We can take your LLC interest from you. The charging order is not the sole and exclusive remedy because the statute doesn't say sole and exclusive, it does not read sole and exclusive remedy. If it was written similar to Nevada's statute, then we couldn't give it away. But since it doesn't have those words in it, we're free to give it away to the government. Now, the facts of the case are disturbing, but, and you would say, well, the government should take this individual's money, but you, you have to separate it. You have to look at it in the whole and say, you know, on the statute and the face of the person allowed, a creditor allowed to take their interest. So in that case they were, but you can see the thinking of the court was that they, they stated that if it contains specific language, we can't. Now that specific language they drew upon was Nevada's statute. Now I'm not saying this is why I've always chosen Nevada. I mean, it is a strong reason why, but it's not based upon the Olmstead decision. It's that when we look at things, we choose the state, we're looking at a number of factors. Number one, we want to see that language in your statute. Is the charging order the sole and exclusive remedy? States that it is in this state. So if somebody sued you, you had an LLC set up in Kansas, they could not take your LLC from you. So why not just set up a Kansas LLC? You can. I have no problem doing that for clients. I'll set you up one, but if you want some additional protection, then you're going to have to go out of state. So what I mean by additional protection? Well, there's an, some other protection that comes with this. See, when you set up an LLC here in Kansas, you have to give them some information. They want to know who the members are, who the manager is of that LLC. So if it's your LLC, then it's your name that's going to be listed on the, with the Secretary of State. So if I want to know what you have going on in your life, all I need to do is go and run a search. Bam, there you are. You've got an LLC. It's called uh, DDRV. Okay? I know that it's you then that holds this. So that aspect of it is what we call anonymity. Okay? There's no anonymity there. I can do an asset search from you, and I can figure out what you have. Now, some people don't like other people knowing what they have especially after the RV. Do you want your local bank to know that you've come into money? Because sometimes people have loose lips and they start telling everybody else in the neighborhood that you come into money, next thing you know, you got a bunch of friends you never knew you had. So what you do in that situation, you choose another state that has additional protections that, do not, that will not allow the state to disclose your private information. That's what Nevada and Wyoming offer set up an, an LLC there, you use a nominee manager. So we have one of our attorneys serve as the initial manager in your limited liability company. And then he resigns and then you get appointed the manager, you're in complete control, you're the member, but if somebody did an asset search from you, this box will never show up as being your box. There's no way they're gonna find it's attached to you unless you disclose that information. So that right there is great protection. It discourages people. I mean, I, how could I put it to you in a different way? Oh. I am a new owner of a cat. Never been a big cat person. I'm a dog person. But we got a cat. Kind of a cool cat. It's a ragdoll cat. Big cat. Looks like a dog. That's why we got it. Uh, now, this cat, when they're young, and anyway, that's the way I grew up. You know, jumps up on the counter. Can't have that. Cats cannot jump on the counter. If it does, what do you do? Okay, you said squirt it. She <laughs> says shoo it off. Well, my wife and I have different ways of handling the jump. Okay? I was taught, bam, smack the cat. <laughs> Falls off the counter. She'll go and squirt, and we have water all over the house from her squirting the cat. Frankly, I'm thinking, hey, there's liability there, water on the floor, somebody come over, slip on that, slip and fall, and they sue. I'm an attorney, I'm thinking always in liability. So, when I was a kid, we had a cat too, and mouse or cat, go down the barn, and, but it became more of a house cat after a while. My dad would hit that cat, it would fall off the counter. Finally, it never jumped up again. Why is that? Equilibrium was all screwed up. <laughs> Couldn't jump. No. No, no, it didn't happen like that. <laughs> Sounds good, though. Uh, no, it doesn't sound good. Anyways, so what people did back then, I remember this. I went to one person's house one time, and I sat down on their couch, and I'm like, what the heck? 
There's dust in the air when you sat down. They go, oh, we just got a new cat. And I said, what does it do, cough dust? <laughs> they go, oh, no, that's to keep the cat off the furniture. I go, what do you mean it keeps the, oh, yeah, we got this stuff. This, maybe it smells like dog or something. And it's just going to be a while. We just sprinkle it on all of our stuff. And the cat comes by and sniffs it, and it won't jump up. We don't have to hit it. We don't have to spray it. Isn't that cool? Yeah, if you like sitting in dust. So, that's a humane way. And if you think about it, cats sniff. They don't like the smell they leave. You set up a Nevada LLC, it's the same way with attorneys. It's attorney be gone. They come <laughs> sniffing around. They don't like what they smell because there's nothing for them to get. Does that make sense now? All right. So that's another protection. It's because they can't get it. Now, the third form of protection, which is probably by far even more powerful of a detriment or deterrent than the fact that they can't get the interest, the fact that they don't know you have the interest, but they would if they sued you and they were successful. They would, you would have to disclose this eventually. But think of it. Here we are in Kansas. Attorney sues you and they bring you into the deposition because it's called supplemental proceedings, and now, Nick, I get to find out everything you own. And I'm thinking to myself, payday, wife's getting a new car because we just sued Nick, and I ask you, Nick, what do you own, Nick? What do you say? And where's that box located, Nick? Uh, it's located in Nevada. What? Can you repeat that again, Nick? I don't think we got that. Uh, oh, you have a Nevada box. All right, uh, thank you, Nick. So now I gotta go back to my client and tell my client, I've got a problem. Nick put together one of them Nevada boxes. And we're gonna have to hire another attorney. How much money you got? That's what he's going to have to ask him. Because you've got a judgment here in Kansas. You've got a Nevada box. It's not registered to do business here because it's not doing business here. If it was registered to do business, we don't have a problem. But we're not going to register it here because it's not doing business here. So now we have to go to Nevada, hire an attorney to go place a charging order on your box. Does that come cheap? No. It's going to come at a cost of probably between six to ten thousand dollars that the plaintiff's client will have to come up with in order to put that charging order on your box. Now do they want to go to that trouble? Depends on how much you upset them. You know if you really upset them maybe they're willing to do it. That's fine. Let them. Who cares? Because once they go to that trouble to put the charging order on my box then the game because I will come up to you, let's assume that you sued me, and I would say to you, who haven't we picked on yet? Ray. So, Ray, you hired Terry over there to represent you. I mean, he looks like an attorney today, looking good, Terry, suit and tie. Uh, he represented you, and he's, he's a good talker, because he convinced my mother-in-law that you deserve one, two, three, four, eight pieces of candy. Now, how much you been paid yet, Ray? I know, how's that setting for you? Not too good. I know, that's too bad. Well, I know you're entitled to eight, but I understand you got hurt. And believe me, I don't want to hurt you, Ray. You know, I believe that it's my duty as a citizen to make sure that you're made whole. But I don't think it's my duty as a citizen to make sure that you profit off of my mistakes. Now, you, Terry over there may think so because he just we can't wait to get his little greedy hands on all my candy. That's not going to happen, Ray. So here's what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to offer you three pieces of candy in order to settle because I think that's fair based upon the injuries you sustained. What do you say, Ray? Better talk to Terry first. <laughs> What do you say, Terry? You're entitled to eight, and you get 50% of that. But do you want four pieces or one and a half? Yeah, greedy attorney saying, no, hold out. We're going to get it all. Okay, fine. That's fine. I don't talk to you for 
a year, and I come back to you a year later, and I say to you, Ray, how'd that charge going work out for you, Ray? You still talking to Terry? I didn't think so. You're right. So, you willing to settle? Are you willing to settle, Ray? Okay, great. Well, what did I, you know, my, my memory's kind of bad, uh, you know, Ray, being out in the sun and all. What, what did I offer you last year? Hmm. That's, that, that's why you got to get better counsel than Terry. <laughs> so you're right, Ray. Three. That's not how I remember it, but I'll tell you what. Since my memory is not too good and all, and I, I know I did hurt you, and I want to make you whole because I believe in making you whole, Ray. So I think I'm going to offer you exactly what you, I think what I did last time. Your injuries make you whole. I'm going to offer you one. Isn't that what I offered you before? Oh, well, that was last year. How much did you get paid again? I know. So now it's one, Ray. Do you want one candy? Okay. My conversation with Ray is now over, and I won't talk to him any longer because I don't need to. That charging order is going to expire, so I'm just going to sit back and wait. Clint needs money. Clint's going to take out a what, Gene? Get money out of the LLC? Starts with an L, ends with an N. Loan, that's right. Looking for help over here. Is this your lifeline? Okay. She's going to take, I'm going to take out a loan. No, you couldn't take all out as a full loan, but you could take out a loan. So I'm going to take out a loan. Now, is Ray or Terry going to be fixated on this LLC for seven years when the charging order expires, getting ready to go back and hire an attorney to go and slap that again on my LLC? Or do you think that they might slip up and forget about it? I think the answer to that is no. And I just know from my own experience, you know, the few liens and stuff that I've filed in the past, you forget about them. And all of a sudden, one day, you know, the secretary brings you in a check. She goes, what's this check for? We just got a check for 75000 something something dollars. So did? What do you think I say? You tell the partners. <laughs> if you didn't, there's a third of it for you. Uh, <laughs> No, what has happened is that you filed a lien against somebody in the county where you got the judgment against them, and that lien stays there until they sold a piece of property. And as soon as they've sold a piece of property, that's the first thing that gets paid off after the underlying lien to the bank, and that got sent to our firm. And so part of that's owed to the client, part of that's owed to me, and all of a sudden that's like free money. But you don't remember until the time you get the check. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember the Johnson case. All right, finally paid off. Well. I doubt they're going to be following on to this. And so what's going to happen is when your lien expires, or when that charge order expires, what are you going to do? You're going to create a new box. And what are you going to do with this new box? Right, I'm going to take everything out of this box and put it into my new box. Now, what am I going to do with this box? That's right, bait. Yeah, I'm going to wave this in front of Ray's face. You smelling it, Ray? He's like, oh, yeah, that box. Terry, get on it. Come on, boy. Get down there and file that. And they're going to run right back down and put the lien on this box. And guess what I got? I got me a FedExer over here that they don't know about. And I can take distributions all day long because there's no charging order because my name doesn't attach to this Nevada one. They just know about that one. And so this will go on and you'll never get paid. And that's the way it works. Now. What I've just described to you is a situation of somebody taking a lawsuit against you with a judgment all the way through to the charging order. How often does this occur? Rarely. This rarely occurs. And as a result of that, when people ask me, well, how much case law do you have to back up what you're saying? Not a lot. Not a lot. And the reason why there's not a lot of case law out there, because attorneys do not typically take it to this level. 
Number one reason, it's too expensive and too difficult to try to get after the assets. The other thing is you have to go to court and you argue in front of a judge who typically doesn't understand most of the stuff to begin with, and then you know, you're know you in a situation where to go against you real easy. So they tend to shy away from this type of action. And so this immediately, if they once they find out that you have it, they're going to start talking settlement. And I know that first-hand experience of how this works, because I have been involved in a few situations where it's come up with clients, the other side looks at it, and you can just see that they're deflated once they find out that these have been set up. Or they know ahead of time that they've been set up because they just figure it based upon who's been, who they've been working with, and they start talking settlement. And if they don't, just the cost alone will put them into well, you could put them into bankruptcy, as we did one time. When I first started the practice, we had a, an attorney that worked with us. Whenever you go into partnerships with people, there's all, well, not always, but there's a good likelihood there's going to be one who thinks he's entitled to everything and doesn't have to do anything for it. And when you're so busy working, you're not paying attention to it, but finally one day you start looking at what's going on. You say, hey, man, what are you doing? You either put forth more or you're out of here. They look you in the eye and they say, listen, you don't understand, okay? I'm just more efficient than you. I can do in three hours, it takes you 10 hours to do, and that's why I'm entitled to the same amount of money. Okay, we'll see how that plays out. You're out of here. So I fired, we fired a partner, kicked him out of our partnership back in, two, was it 2000 we kicked that guy out, Greg? 2001. And this is how screwed up the legal system is. We kicked this guy out. We have meeting minutes saying that we've just removed him from the partnership. He's no longer a partner. He went out and immediately we told him to pack up and get out of the office. He went out and he told several of the employees that we were SOBs, that we just kicked him out of the partnership. And then he was kind enough to send several emails to individuals as well, you know, saying what SOBs we were for kicking, kicking him out of the partnership. Now, one year later, comes to us, he asks us for money. He said, no, you're not getting any money. We actually gave him some money when we kicked him out. But you're not getting any more. So he went and hired an attorney, and they filed a lawsuit against us. And they said, in their, or they stated in their lawsuit that he was still a partner. Now, you gotta be kidding me, you're still a partner? No, so I went into court, and we tried to get the judge to take what called judicial notice of the fact that this individual was no longer a partner, and we brought into court sworn affidavits from the nine people that he told on the day in question that he was kicked out, that he went out to him and he told him that he was just been removed as a partner and he hated us for it and blah, blah, blah. They had their own sworn statements that he'd talked to. We brought in copies of his emails where he'd sent to people. We got from the individuals. So it wasn't from our system. We got it from the individuals. And we brought in our meeting minute notes. We said, Your Honor, let's just dispense with this right now. Would you take judicial notice of this? You know what the judge said? That's a question for the jury. I tell you, that's when I lost all faith in the legal system. Right at that point, well, I was our question beforehand, but right then there I just said, you got to be kidding me. What do we need to do in order to dispense with this type of legal process? Basically spend money on attorneys. So that became who can spend more. Well, we spent more. We forced him to go down to Las Vegas and fight the action. He tried to come after us. We got it removed to that jurisdiction, and right then and there, we forced him into involuntary bankruptcy because he ran out of money and he owed people. And so we brought that action against him, and that wound up the case. So there's tactical maneuvers that take place when you create these entities and move them to ju other jurisdictions that work in your favor. And that's why I believe if you're looking to protect liquid types of investments, your dinar, cash, gold, Stick it in a jurisdiction that's out of reach. Don't make it easy for somebody to harass you with a lawsuit. Make it difficult and build your barriers. And that's what that would do. And that's why I recommend people create them in Nevada for those three reasons that I just laid out for you. Any questions on that? Yeah. What are the requirements for establishing an LLC in Nevada for holding these liquid assets? They're really, I mean, you have to have a resident agent, and that's it. A name, nothing more than that. 
Now, I mean, we tell you you should have a business address there, so you have a physical presence, phone number. So you, have, you, should, you should use a nominee, somebody who serves, so that if somebody looks your name up, you're not going to be attached to it. Take advantage of that. Uh, I would recommend you have a bank account. So whenever we set up a Nevada LLC for our clients, we give them a choice. They can either bank with Chase, Wells Fargo, or Bank of America. We will open that account for you. Well, let me rephrase how that works. What we do is we contact the bank and we say we have a client. We have a banking relationship with these three banks. So our clients do not have to physically go to the branch to open their account. We just tell them we're working with this client. We've established a business with them. They would like to utilize your services for their Nevada bank account. Here's their contact information. At that point, we step back. We're no longer involved in the process. They will contact you directly, and they, then you'll work with them to open your account up. They'll send you the signature card and back and forth. So you should have a bank account there as well, is what you would do. And that goes, I mean, you're going to want that anyways because when your dinar is placed inside of the LLC, and when it RVs, you go down to cash it in. You want those funds to go directly into the LLC. And if the LLC isn't in place and the bank account isn't there, it's going to go into your personal account at that point in time. So that's why it's so important you have that account opened up ahead of the RV. Yeah, do you have a question? There's another question over here. Yeah. That's an excellent question. The question was, do you have to file taxes in that state? And the answer to that is no, you do not. Nevada does not tax its entities. The only way you have, well, I misstated there. Nevada has a state tax. It only applies if you live in that state and you have employees. You do not live there as a business owner. You do not have employees. Therefore, you do not pay tax. The LLC itself does not pay tax. When you create the LLC, you have two choices. You can create it as a single member disregarded entity. So Greg, in your situation, if you're going to create it as a single member disregarded entity, that would file a federal tax return. It means it only has one owner. That one owner would be Lisa. Um, if you, <laughs> you think I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you want to have husband and wife both owning the LLC, because you do not live in a community property state, it would have to be set up as a partnership. Now again, it doesn't have to file a tax, I mean, it has to file a tax return, but the LLC does not pay any taxes. It's purely a flow through entity. It flows down onto your individual 1040. So it's tax neutral. We get a lot of questions on this. People ask us, how is this going to impact my overall uh, tax situation? It will not. Zero. One way or the other. Not to the negative, nor to the positive in creating this entity. This entity is purely for asset protection to mask the fact that you've just come into some cash and to protect it. That's why you've set it up. Yeah. Questions? Great question. What's the difference between doing it pre-exchange, post-exchange? Pre-exchange, your box is set up, it's already done. When you go to, if you're involved and something were to happen to you right now, it's all protected. Nobody can get after it, number one. Number two, when you go to exchange in your dinar, you have an account, you have an LLC that's already set up on the RV day, money goes right into there. It's all done for you. If you wait till post exchange, what's going to happen is you have to go and go through the process of setting this up. How long does it take typically to set up an LLC in Nevada? It will run, on average, it takes us about two weeks. Now, that's not to set up the LLC. What takes the longest is getting the bank account established. That's what takes the time for the client, is to get their bank account up and running with their LLC. So the LLC, I can set up rel relatively quickly in a couple days. Uh, it would be in your hands for signature, but it's the bank account. Getting that set up takes the time. So that's why people have opted to set it up, number one. Uh, the LLC is so that the funds will go directly over into it. Otherwise, it will have to go into your own name. Another reason why people have opted to set this up. When you set up an LLC, you're the manager, right? Managers control the LLC. Managers make all decisions about who's going to get candy out of the LLC. So if we set up an LLC and 
I have Bonnie as one of my members, and is it, is it Steph? Kathleen as the other member, and I give Kathleen 30%, Bonnie 30%, and I have 40%. And I have my LLC set up where it requires 85% of the members, one, two, three, to agree to replace the manager. Now, who's the manager? Clint. So in order to replace me, who has to agree? Yeah. Am I ever going to agree to replace myself? No. Never. Now, my LLC is set up where they're not entitled to distributions. You don't get any money out of here unless Clint decides you get money. Clint could do this. Clint gets money. What do you guys get? Nothing. Okay? How do you like them apples? So, you set this up. You also have some control. I would have control over Kathleen and Bonnie. This RVs, and I have a million dollars in here in income. How much is taxable to Clint? I have 40%. 40% of the million is $400,000. $300,000 to you, Bonnie. $300,000 to you, Kathleen. It's a flow through entity. You own 30%. You're, you're responsible for 30% of the income that's generated inside of here. Now, all of a sudden, you've just made $300,000. How much of that can you touch and feel and spend? Nothing. Now, do you have to pay taxes on that money? You bet you do. But you don't have it, do you? What a dilemma. <laughs> We've got a problem here. Now, could I decide to give you money if I was in a generous spirit? Absolutely. But if you upset me, yeah, so I'd say, Kathleen, you want a distribution? Yeah, Clint, I got to, you know, I'm going to look, I'm going to have this out. I'm going to pay $90,000 in income taxes. Okay, well, see my car out there? It could really do with the good wash and wax. What you doing tomorrow? <laughs> could I do that to her? Absolutely. So the question is, do you want $90,000 or you want to wash and wax my car first? Now, I would, oh, I'll come right to you, Norman. I wouldn't do this initially, but I wouldn't do it with them, but think about your children. Okay, you do this with your kids. You gift this interest pre-dinar so it doesn't cost you anything for gift tax purposes, and now you've owned them for life. <laughs> yeah. See, when I was going to law school, my dad played this game with me all the time. Hey, what are you doing today? This is during the summer. I get these calls at 5 a.m. I didn't know it was light out yet. Is it day? Really, it's day over in Bremerton because it's not day over in Federal Way yet. I'm looking outside. Gosh, it's funny how the sun came up today, Dad. He goes, it's day somewhere. And I'll tell you what, we're going to re-roof a house today. Did I hear you say we? I think I got a bad connection on the phone. Because You heard me right. We are re-roofing the house on Calo. Uh, I don't know if I can make that, Dad. That's what I would hear. You still there? Uh huh. What you doing? Calculating. <laughs> what are you calculating, Dad? When you go back to school? <laughs> Six weeks. He goes, all right, that's 30 days. No, no, it's, that's 42 days. And how much is law school? Well, you know, you cut the check. It's $22,000. I know that. So. 42 days into $22,000. I figured then you're going to need to make about $500 a day between now and law school. If I don't see your, you use some expletives there, in about 45 minutes to help me re-roof the house. What is it? You're going to help me or are you going to go out and start working? How about if I get there in 30 minutes? Will I get a bonus? <laughs> see, he had me. He had me. You always have your kids because if they don't come over and visit enough, there's a tax liability this year. We didn't see you. <laughs> there's no money for you. Yeah, that's the power. And so people have said they wanted to gift the Norway. I said, through an LLC, gift them it, and it's a disguised gift. They may be happy today, but next year when they got to pay taxes, different story because you don't have to distribute money to them. Because your agreement states that you're, they're not entitled to receive a distribution. All distributions are left up to the discretion of the manager of the LLC.
Nora, your question. Well, you bring your LLC operating agreement down with all your schedules to show that you transferred it over to the LLC on the date in which we specified. I provide it all. That's right. And if you need to, we we'll provide you a certification that you'll have notarized. So it would protect them. The certification is actually already written into your management or your LLC operating agreement, and it states that you as a manager certified of the following, blah, blah, blah. This is what you'd provide them. And that's sufficient in order for that to occur. Any provision for the death of the manager? Yes, the members would then agree to appoint a new manager at that point in time. The remaining members, yes. The child in the LLC would be referred to as a member because they own an interest in it. So, I mean, I've had a lot of, just one I was working with the other yesterday, or this week. He sent me over. Uh, this guy actually bought his in theater. He was, a, it was, a, uh, he was in the Army, and he was over there on tour, and he bought his for $700 for, per million. And I, I, he was telling me, and I go, well, what got you interested? He said, well, because of all my, uh, not all my buddies. He had a few guys that were over there during Kuwait, and they, got, they were invested in the Kuwaiti dinar. Yeah, they made a lot of money. And so they, of course, got out of the military as soon as they could, and they're not working. Uh, they're doing other things. And he said, this opportunity is not going to pass me by. And he sent over his dinar, the amount of dinar that he had, and let's just use pick a round number. He said 10 million. And he told me that he wants both of his daughters to each own 15%. So what I have done is I've put together an LLC where he and his wife each own 50% of the LLC. So each of them transferred in 5 million dinar. They signed the agreement, all done. And then I prepared a gift of their interest. So I gifted 15% from him to one of his daughters, and I gifted 15% from his wife to the other daughter. So each of them received 1.5 million dinar, each daughter did. And then we had them sign the assignment and admitted them as a member to the limited liability company. So there's another form that they had to sign where the membership agreed to admit the daughters as new members to the LLC. And they received, each of them received a, that 15% ownership interest. So now all four of them are in the LLC, but the mom and dad are the ones that are in control of that LLC. And daughters, of course, own it. Now, if they're minor daughters, minor children, which these two are, when we gift it, we gift it to the guardian of the daughter. So when I gift from the mother to the one daughter, I gifted it to the daughter in care of the husband as a natural guardian for the minor child. See, when you gift to a minor child, you have to gift it to a guardian in care of them. So that's how we had to gift the interest over. If they're already of age of 18, 18 years older, then we can gift it to them directly. We don't need to go that route. But if they're a minor, then we have to go a little different route to get it to them. And then they become members of the LLC. So at that point on, when it RVs, they're responsible for 15% of the income that's generated inside of there. And of course, you would give them a distribution to pay their tax liability at that point in time. So that's how the LLC works. Any questions on that? <laughs> it's all about money. You don't want them to have it at 18. That's exactly right. Greg asked, can a LLC be controlled by the manager without reporting to a board? Absolutely. That's how they're set up by default. If you want us to create management committees, we can complicate it for you. I would recommend we do not, but that's what I would do. All right, so how do you want to be perceived in a lawsuit? Okay, this is Doug over here. Doug owns everything in his own name. He carries it around in a rubber band. Okay. There's Greg. All right, Greg's inside of a box. 
So obviously, you know, it's pretty clear what would happen there. Okay, keep in your own name, there's really no protection. 